Okay, so I was asked to... talk about am I coupling at uh, Jupiter and Saturn or at rotation driven magnetospheres in general. We've already heard <coughs> something about this. So my time, my clock starts now, right? Uh, <coughs> We've heard something about this yesterday from, from uh, Fran and, and Melissa in particular. Uh, these are my collaborators at Rice. And largely what I will show you is the work of Xin Liu, uh, <coughs> a recent student who finished up uh, early last year and did most of the actual uh, modeling that I'll be showing you. So I'll start off with a little bit of history and climatology of the subject. Uh, climatology, I picked that word because it seems to be a buzzword at this meeting. Uh, just the overall picture. <coughs> and from past studies we've learned, and also more recent studies uh, <coughs> driven by Cassini data, we've learned that interchange transport is the main radial transport mechanism, both at Jupiter and Saturn. <coughs> so I'll talk a little bit about how we know this is true and what we still don't know about the process, and then finish off with a couple of comments about comparative many sphere studies. So first of all, when we say amp, uh, magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, we're implying that there are two separate regions, spatially separate uh, regions, where the magnetosphere is largely a collisionless plasma and the ionosphere is a largely collisional plasma, so they obey different equations, they behave differently. <coughs> spatially separate but clearly coupled one to the other. So I'll be, uh, I won't be talking about Venus and Mars, although they're very interesting interactions, because there the magnetosphere and ionosphere uh, are not clearly distinguishable regions. They share the same region of space. <coughs> so this leaves the other magnetospheres in the solar system, the intrinsic magnetospheres, including <coughs> Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. <coughs> where the solar wind is largely excluded from direct contact with the uh, ionosphere. So some of the features of MI coupling are common to all the magnetosphere, uh, planetary magnetospheres that we know of. And here are a few examples of the commonalities. <coughs> First of all, the Birkeland, or magnetic field aligned currents, <coughs> in all cases, transmit electromagnetic stresses between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere, which couples their convective E cross B drift motions. Uh, it's also true that plasma can be exchanged between the two regions by flow along magnetic field lines, which couples not only their motions, but also their chemical compositions. <coughs> and those Birkeland currents especially when they're upward, uh, tend to produce bright auroral emissions and non-thermal radio emissions, which makes the ionosphere essentially a television screen, a two-dimensional ma map of what's happening in the three-dimensional magnetosphere, although reading this map is not trivial and often uh, gives rise to uncertainties and controversies. But of course, not all the planets are alike. Uh, one uh, very useful classification scheme to separate one from another is the distinction between a solar wind-driven magnetosphere, like those at Mercury and Earth, uh, versus the solar wind, the, the uh, rotation-driven magnetospheres, like those at Jupiter and Saturn, and most likely also Uranus and Neptune, although we have much less observational information about Uranus and Neptune. Uh, we've learned quite a bit about Jupiter by virtue of the Galileo orbiting spacecraft and about Saturn by virtue of the orbiting Cassini spacecraft. So there's probably a, well, in, in principle, there's a continuous spectrum between solar wind driving and rotation driving 
But it turns out that in our solar system, so far, um, <clears throat> all the planetary magnetospheres fall pretty clearly at either one end or the other of that uh, spectrum. <coughs> so you're going <coughs> to... Dionetus and Bryce, this was mentioned already, I think, by uh, Melissa yesterday, uh, pointed out that a magnetosphere is solar wind driven if its plasma pause lies well within its magnetopause, well, inside of its magnetosphere. Whereas if, if the plasma pause separating solar wind uh, driven flow from co rotation uh, co co-rotating flow, if that lies uh, well outside the magnetosphere, then that magnetosphere is probably rotation-driven, uh, at least it has the capacity to be rotation-driven. And so we've seen this concept discussed already <coughs> by, I think, both Fran and Melissa, but it's uh, just doing the simple comparison makes it clear that Earth's and Mercury's magnetosphere are clearly solar wind driven, and Jupiter's and Saturn's are just as clearly rotation driven. This is the plasma pause the concept originated uh, almost simultaneously by Neil Bryce and Hiro Nishida. <coughs> the idea that uh, if you have a solar wind driven flow, which is largely sunward on closed field lines, and if you have a co-rotational flow driven by the planetary atmosphere, then there is, in general, a uh, separate, uh, separator, topological separator, between the rotation-driven flow and the solar wind-driven flow. <coughs> and you can calculate roughly where that separator will lie relative to the planet. In the case of Earth, and even more so in the case of Mercury, that uh, plasma pause separator lies well inside the magnetosphere. In the cases of Jupiter and Saturn, it lies well outside the magnetosphere. So here the magnetopause is the same size in all three panels, but the planet is scaled appropriately, so Earth fills up this fraction of its magnetosphere. Mercury fills up that fraction. Jupiter, even though it's the largest planet, you can barely see it here, relative to the size of its magnetosphere. And Saturn is a little bit is in intermediate between Earth and Jupiter in terms of size, but it's not intermediate in terms of uh, rotational driving. It's still clearly uh, rotationally driven. But in order for this rotational driving to be interesting, uh, the magnetosphere also needs an internal source of plasma. And the two best known examples, Jupiter and Saturn, the internal plasma is provided by satellites which are embedded deep within the uh, inner magnetosphere. Those sources uh, are dominated by the satellite EO at Jupiter and by the satellite uh, Enceladus at Saturn, <coughs> as we now know thanks to the uh, two orbiting spacecraft missions. And it's the outward transport of this internally generated plasma which extracts rotational energy from the planet. It doesn't just uh, passively co-rotate with, with the planet, but it actually extracts <coughs> rotational energy from the planet, which is available then to power uh, magnetospheric convection and all the phenomena that follow from magnetospheric convection. So you've seen this before from both Fran and, and Melissa. The main plasma source at Jupiter is the satellite EO, which is buried well within, deep within Jupiter's magnetosphere by virtue of its volcanoes. And Enceladus plays the same role at Saturn, uh, buried not quite as deeply, but still deeply within, uh, within the inner magnetosphere of Saturn by virtue of its water <coughs> and ice geysers that, for some reason, uh, are constantly uh, <coughs> em being emitted from its uh, south polar region. So we have the internal sources that are necessary to drive radial 
convection in the magnetosphere. And that's accomplished by uh, what I call centrifugally driven flux tube interchange motions, which are illustrated by this cartoon. We have an interior source of plasma, which is relatively dense and cool, <coughs> which moves outward through E cross V drift. And we have an out, outward source of a more tenuous but hotter plasma, which moves inward to compensate for this outflow. You have to conserve magnetic flux. So if you have outflow one place, you have to have in, inflow somewhere else. <coughs> but the hot plasma drifting in towards the planet will eventually uh, exhibit a noticeable gradient curvature drift, which is in the opposite directions for positive ions and electrons, which gives rise to a dispersion signature, which may or may not be detectable. It's more likely to be detectable the closer you get to the plasma, to, to the planet. And that really, that uh, dispersion phenomenon is, is what I call the smoking gun of the interchange transport process especially at Saturn, where it's especially easy to, to observe. So here's an example of a dispersion signature from the Cassini plasma spectrometer. Uh, it's just one example, but these occur every time Cassini passes through the intermagnetosphere. Electrons on the top, ions on the bottom, energy on a linear scale, not the logarithmic scale that we're used to looking at, linear energy versus linear time, this is uh, two hours across here, yeah. <clears throat> and you see the energy varying as a function of time, which really means as a function of longitude, because uh, the longitude system is being swept past the Cassini spacecraft, which is almost stationary by comparison with that rotational flow. So as a function of time, the electrons show a characteristic energy that increases with time, while the ions, when you can see them, show a characteristic energy which has the opposite dependence on time or on longitude. Taken together, the electrons and the ions form a V-shaped structure, which is the dispersion structure that we're looking for. This is observed uh, quite routinely in the region between about 5 and 10 Saturn radii, which uh, is roughly the inner half of Saturn's magnetosphere. It's a process quite analogous to the, to the uh, <coughs> plasma sheet injection and dispersion, which was, uh, has been observed at Earth uh, since, I guess, the, the late 60s and early 70s, which is driven by a different uh, process, but gives rise to the same characteristic signature of inward drift followed by dispersion. That hot plasma from the outer magnetosphere has to come from somewhere. I think the most likely place is the uh, <coughs> formation of plasmoids in the uh, magnetotail, <coughs> which are not a steady state phenomenon as pictured here, but are clearly episodic. They come and they go, but they supply uh, a, an outward, uh, an outer source of hotter plasma, which has been accelerated, but much more tenuous plasma, because the plasmoid formation gets rid of most of the plasma that, that was uh, <coughs> originally present on those flux tubes. So this is a famous a diagram drawn by uh, drawn by Vitanis for Jupiter originally in uh, around 1980 but it turns out to be equally applicable to Saturn. So we've used the Rice convection model to simulate this plasma convection <coughs> in uh, both Jupiter's and Saturn's inner magnetospheres. And of course, we've learned something as we've gone along, so our Saturn simulations are of a higher quality than our earlier Jupiter ones. We apply the RCM in the co-rotating frame of reference for technical reasons that I won't go into, but uh, it turns out the co-rotating frame allows you to solve the uh, equations 
uh, in a numerically stable fashion, uh, which turns out to be very non-trivial in the inertial frame of reference. Uh, we, uh, so far, we have treated the region between L of about 2 and about 12 <coughs> because that's the region where the magnetic field is observed to be nearly dipolar. The outward stretching hasn't yet kicked in. Uh, and also nearly time independent, which certainly uh, facilitates the, the calculation. The uh, Rice convection model assumes electrostatic magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. In other words, it neglects the effect of waves. <coughs> and the ionosphere itself is represented by a spherical conducting shell, not by a real ionosphere. So, apologize to Bob Lysak for making those approximations, but they enable us to make some progress with the convection calculations. So here's the Earth version of the RCM, which Dick talked about on Wednesday, so I don't need to go through this again. Uh, I just want to highlight the differences the modifications to the code that we have to do in order to apply to a rapidly rotating <coughs> planet. We have to change the plasma boundary conditions. I've talked a little bit about that already with the inward source of uh, dense cool plasma and the outward source of hot tenuous plasma. At Saturn in particular, we need to include in the calculation a model for the source and the loss of plasma. Uh, the plasma is introduced to the magnetosphere not only through the boundary conditions, but uh, through an embedded uh, plasma source, which is continuously operating. It's Eo at Jupiter and Enceladus at Saturn. <coughs> when we track the drift motion of the plasma, we have to include not only the gradient curvature drift, which is included at Earth, but also three new drifts, which are uh, induced by rotation, which we don't have to worry about at Earth, but we certainly do at Jupiter and Saturn. These are the centrifugal force drift, the Coriolis acceleration drift, and the uh, <coughs> drift associated with the pickup of new ions created by the uh, internal sources within the magnetosphere. We also have to modify the potential boundary conditions, electrostatic potential boundary conditions on the uh, simulation domain, which are essentially inside out at Jupiter and Saturn compared with the Earth, because the plasma source is inside, not outside. Two minutes. Really? OK. Uh, <coughs> I'll skip this. I'll skip this. This is our plasma source versus L. Uh, <coughs> this is a frame from a simulation movie uh, showing the magnetosphere filling up with plasma. Color is flux tube content. <coughs> and in this case, it's just the cold plasma from the inter in internal source. Time progresses this way. And eventually, these, these fingers form to drain this torus of plasma. And at, at the time, evolution becomes chaotic. The fingers move. They don't stay in the same place. But they serve to transport the cold, dense plasma outward towards the outer magnetosphere. Skip this. Skip this. Uh, we've, we've started recently to uh, include the hot tenuous plasma from the outward source. This is largely Sheen's uh, PhD thesis work. Uh, we use CAPS observations to drive the code. We, uh, <coughs> so we have a movie, which I will attempt to play for you. Now, this, this code includes the hot plasma. So here's cold plasma from the internal source. These panels when they start running, will we'll show the inward intrusion of the hot plasma from the outward source at four different uh, particle energy invariants. This is 
top two are uh, water group positive ions, the bottom two are electrons. Let me click that and see what happens. <clears throat> so the fingers start to form, and when those fingers reach the outer boundary, that triggers the inward injection of the hot plasma. So these are very different color bars. This stuff is much less dense than this stuff, but it moves in as hmm? zero minutes. Okay, um, just let me mention that these fingers of plasma moving inward and outward uh, produce a patchy structure of the aurora. This is a very crude preliminary attempt to show that, and this is a set of observations by the Cassini ultraviolet imager, which have an uh, encouraging similarity. Uh, I have to skip all of this, except the, the bottom line. This is one of the observed simulation, uh, one of the observed uh, dispersions I showed you earlier. This is our simulated dispersion, which matches. Okay, let me just uh, skip all of this. Turns out that Saturn, but not Jupiter, exhibits the smoking gun for interchange transport for very straightforward region, uh, reasons which we understand. Uh, and just a few conclusions related to comparative magnetospheres. So let me stop there. Tom, I'm really excited by that last result you showed, and I want to point out one of my own papers the last year or so. We found that from polar 9RE in the Earth's magnetotail, just before a substorm injection, there's an oscillatory period that appears with outward cold plasma motion, inward hot plasma motion, kind of a growing oscillation that then turns into the injection. It's kind of nifty analogy. Sounds like the same process, but driven by different uh, forces. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you talk about the smoking gun, but we actually did find the, the conclusive evidence for interchange at uh, Jupiter yes, through the Galileo did. data. Yes, you did. We found the magnetic and the particle signatures for right. this. Uh, and and the waves. And I should have mentioned that, but that was, <coughs> that was a, uh, a lot of hard work to find it. You'll, you'll agree with that, right? Oh, okay. it, did, it, didn't, it didn't. It was, it was it, lucky. It, but it didn't jump out at you, oh, yes, it did. as it does at Saturn. Well, we remember at, on Galileo, we had very limited data. We have 40 bits a second. And right. uh, we only had it for very small, small snippets of time. Right. There are various reasons why it was less obvious at, at Jupiter than it was at Saturn. That was, one of the, that was one of the slides I had to skip. Very near Iowa. Um, but not, but not outside. The we were only able to uh, to see the particle signatures very clearly uh, on a few events, but we could see right. the wave signatures, which are a consequence of that of that particle injection right. throughout the uh, the entire mid middle magnetosphere of Jupiter. Right. And if Maggie wants to comment, I just wanted to make a comment. I'd like to think of you uh, of one more magnetosphere, uh, Ganymede, which is the ultimate non-rotator. Since right. relative to its magnetosphere, it doesn't rotate at all. Right. Okay. Well, I first wanted to comment that the uh, simulations that you are showing look like something that those that Tom and Pat in the '76 might have been wearing on a T-shirt. But uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, uh, talking about since you bring up waves, um, one thing I'm, I'm I. I don't really know about, and uh, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Does Enceladus have have uh, have alphane wings and the same sort of interaction with the Saturn magnetosphere that that Io has with Jupiter? It certainly has something analogous to alphane wings. They're they're not clean, you know, classical alphane wings. But yeah, it certainly has the the, anal the analog of alphane wings. In fact, the uh, 
a rural spot at the footprint of Enceladus has been found. It was, it was a tough search because it's nowhere near as bright as, as the case of the three-gallon land moons at Jupiter. But it is there. Okay, Tom, thank you.